How are people feeling for their uh, project proposals? Good shape? Thumbs up, thumbs down, still figuring it out, no idea, thumbs down? I think I'll stick around a little bit after lecture if anybody wants to chat right now, you know, today about it, but uh, just reach out to us and we'll, we'll give you any feedback we, or ideas we can this week. Okay, well, welcome back everybody. So <clears throat> we're gonna uh, talk today about deep learning for ver the version, the deep learning version of perception. And I, I actually, this is one of the harder lectures for me to give because I think the variance of uh, experience in the room is, is the highest of all the, of all the topics we cover, right? I can sort of assume, every, you might be, it might be a few years since you've drawn a free body diagram, but like everybody's drawn free body diagrams at some point, right? And, and here, you know, I think some people have just, have heard, everybody's heard about it. Some of you have, have, uh, you know, might be training deep networks right now on your laptop while we're in lecture. Some of you haven't dabbled yet, right? Um, and there are plenty of courses here that can teach you uh, the details of deep learning, which I would highly recommend. I'm not gonna try to do any of that. Even computer vision, right? There's huge, there's whole courses on computer vision. I'm not gonna try to cover that. What I'm gonna try to do is dial in a few of the key topics, enough that if you haven't seen it, you can uh, you can use it effectively. If you have seen it, I hope to bring some um, ideas from manipulation that you um, maybe haven't thought about the computer vision pipelines from this perspective, okay? Uh, more than any other lecture, I would say, I'm gonna be reading you guys, um, you know, and trying to speed up or slow down based on, on what you guys are, are feeling. Feel free to ask questions, feel free to be like, yeah, within reason. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I do think that the needs of perception, of, of manipulation for, you know, put particular pressures on our deep learning pipelines that are unique and interesting. Uh, <clears throat> let me just remind you sort of the motivation we talked about is that we've done a lot of work with geometric perception and we had a whole pipeline of clearing clutter out of, a bin, out of the bins that didn't use anything from deep learning, right? And it's surprisingly good, like it can just pick up objects all day long, you could throw any objects in the bin, it'll do its thing. But it doesn't get done everything that we want, right? It has flaws, if, even if your goal is object agnostic, you don't care what objects are moved, you might still have problems because it's not, just the fact that it doesn't know about objects, it can make silly decisions about where to put its fingers, right? It might pick up the hammer from the corner and that's just a bad strategy because there's a large wrench due to the gravitation that would cause the grasp to be fragile, right? So there's, there's a lot, when you go to decide what to do, you know, where to pick things up, you're bringing a lot of background information into the, into the picture that geometry alone doesn't tell you, right? Even physics alone doesn't tell you, maybe don't touch the sharp part of the knife, for instance, right? Um, okay. Uh, in, in practice, in, these particul in the particular tool chain that we gave you, there are quirks like picking up two objects at once because why would, you don't even know where the extents of an object are, right? And so that, that's a problem that these come in. <clears throat> the geometric stuff uh, can do its, take its best effort with partial views. Uh, if, if you have cameras only on one side, there's a backside of the object that you can't see, you know, your point cloud reasoning is only gonna get you so, so far. At some point, inherently, the, only, the way to get farther is to have previous experience which tells you what's behind, on the other side of the object. Right? It's a a data-driven method becomes sort of these, uh, a, a key approach, right? And um, it happens that, that you know, because of our sensors today, and um, you know, it, it turns out that some of our geometric reasoning falls down uh, for transparent objects and other things like that. But fundamentally, you know, there are tasks that just require you to understand objects. If you say, I don't care about the cheese it box, I don't care about the spam, I want to move the mustard bottles over because I'm going to, you know, someone just bought a mustard bottle and I need to put it in the box and ship it, right? Then that is fundamentally requires knowledge of the objects. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's been a revolution in deep learning over the last few years. Um, it was powered mostly by data right, it, it, among other things, and, and compute 
and good ideas and, and a lot of things, but, but everybody talks about the big data. So one of the first topics I want to throw in uh, and, and talk about here is how do we get to big data for manipulation? So the watershed moments um, for deep learning for computer vision ran through the ImageNet data set and the ImageNet challenge, where Fei-Fei and her team um, acquired labels of images of like 128 million images, right? Uh, a lot of images. I think it's one point, is it 1.28 million? That's, that's, I was off by a couple orders of magnitude, but it's a big number, that's the point, yeah? Right? So <clears throat> the go-ahead idea in ImageNet was to crowdsource image labels, right? But it took a lot of acquiring images, cleaning images, and then labeling images to make one big data set which powered a lot of computer vision. If I want to pick up mustard bottles, I don't want to start by picking, by labeling 1.28 million mustard bottles. So what are we to do, right? So <clears throat> let's just, I want to just talk that through and how do, how do we get there for manipulation? And to say, to, to tell that story, let me just make sure I define our basic concepts, right? So when you're talking about diff the standard computer vision tasks for, um, <clears throat> in, in learning, we have to distinguish between a couple different categories, right? So the first one would be image recognition, I just say, is there a sheep in the, in the image? Is there a dog in the image? With what, prob with what confidence would I say that there is a, um, a sheep in the image or a dog in the image? Okay, and that was the classic first task for, for computer vision. That's what ImageNet had a lot of labels for initially. ImageNet also got labels for object detection, right? Which is to say not only that there is a sheep, but here's a bounding box around the sheep. So the output would be two numbers, for instance, the uh, two sets of numbers, four numbers, the, you know, the, the pixel location of the lower left and the pixel location of the upper right, for instance. <clears throat> well, we'll talk about exactly how that's done, too. Uh, and then there's two different types of segmentation, which is very common, uh, <clears throat> which would be the semantic segmentation. I think the picture tells this very well. Semantic segmentation says, make all of the pixels that are sheep pixels blue and the dog pixels red, for instance, in this case, versus instance level segmentation, which is to say, you know, for every different sheep, I want a different label. Okay, so that's the background uh, for this. Which of those do we want for, manip for our manipulation pipeline? If we just want to pick the mustard bottles, for instance, out, which of those is going to be the most useful? Object detection is going to be super useful, right? To, to at least we could then go in and uh, yeah, use our geometric reasoning on the point cloud inside the bounding box, for instance. If we can get a, a pixel-wise segmentation, we could do even better, right? Maybe we can ignore, you know, we, we've talked about the limitations of ICP, for instance, with outliers. If you could really take away all of the points that are not associated with the, the mustard bottle, then that's, that's even the dream. So instant segmentation is actually the the one that's proven to be the most transferable, I would say, from the computer vision world directly into manipulation context of this. We're gonna see where I'm gonna spend most of the time on Thursday talking about all of the things that computer vision people normally don't do that, that help, that are more specific to manipulation. But first, we'll, stalk, we'll, we'll try to understand how to get instant segmentation into our manipulation pipeline. Okay? And there's actually two ways. We'll talk about it at the end, so I'd say, both of our pipelines so far, we could say, and people do actively use instant segmentation. So we'll take, um, we'll take a RGB image, we'll pick, all, pick out the pixels, and we'll then do, for instance, ICP to find the known location and then pick up a known, you know, use model-based grasp syn synthesis. But you could also use instant segmentation with our, our clutter clearing grasp selection. So if I just took the point clouds that were the points in the point cloud that were left after a segmentation, and then I did my antipodal grasping, that'll work too. Both of those are super powerful pipelines. Okay, so 
ImageNet was mostly about object detection and image recognition. Um, <clears throat> Coco dataset was the was the, um, the sort of watershed moment for more instant segmentation. They got uh, many fewer, hundreds of thousands of labels, um, of, but at the pixel-wide level. Now imagine going through and labeling every pixel of every image, right, for 100,000 images. It's a good annotation tools, right, and, and a lot of people on Amazon Turk at the time, right, and, and, and they got it done, but that's a lab laborious task, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the first, well, some of the first annotation tools came out of CSAIL. Antonio Toraldo's upstairs. He's got a, a lab that's done some of the really defining work in this, and um, when this was all starting and, and he was educating the rest of us about crowdsourcing image labels and stuff like this, he said, he said, if you look at the quality of the image labels, you, you pay people like a penny to do that, right? And they're incredibly good. He's like, if you paid me a penny, I'd be just like, you know, go like this and go to the next one. But, but somehow people are just really, really meticulous about getting every single pixel right. And he said, if you if he looked at the statistics and there was an anomaly of like someone who had labeled way more than anybody else, and it turned out it was his mom. <laughs> he said, my mom's an incredibly good labeler, yeah. Okay, but that was this revolution where people started to get crowdsourced large-scale data sets for image segmentation. The, the, one of the crazy things, one of the, uh, you know, the magical things, well, let's just, <clears throat> you know, if you look at the COCO data set, for instance, it's got a bunch of different categories. You can just go to the website and list them, right? It's got bicycles, cars, motorcycles, traffic lights, that's useful for autonomous driving, right? Um, birds, cats, dogs, horses, sheep. Those aren't the things that I wanted manipulate most of the time. There's a few manipulation specific ones. There's, you know, snowboards and plates. There we go, that's a useful one. Plates and bottles and cups and forks. I'd say more than, um, if you take a pre something that's pre-trained on cocoa, it's gonna call most of the things in your, your bin a, a, a mug or a bottle or a fork or something like that, okay. Um, <clears throat> So, so this is super useful, but it's not quite enough for us to do most of the things we want in manipulation. One of the biggest ideas, and I don't think anybody really saw it coming, um, it's even hard to justify still given our best theory of deep learning, but one of the amazing things that happened in deep learning is the story of transfer learning, right? So Coco is a 100,000 uh, image data set. ImageNet was 1.28 million images. The crazy thing is that if you train on ImageNet first, even though it's only got image detection and object detection labels, and you take those weights and then you retrain on Coco, instead of starting from scratch and only using Coco, that you can actually do better on Coco because you trained on ImageNet beforehand. Okay? So this is the this is idea of, of uh, transfer learning or fine tuning. Okay. Training on one data set, pre-training, let's say, on one data set, almost always ImageNet, for instance because it's big and diverse in the right way, um, improves performance on a downstream let me just say on Coco here. It didn't have to be that, right? Why should you, you know, why would you do better having trained previously on ImageNet than just training directly on the objective. That's a, from the optimization point of view, that's a super weird thing to, to think, right? If I were to say, if you solve an inverse kinematics problem on a panda, then you move it over, there you're gonna solve an inverse kinematics problem better on, a, on an IWA. I'd look at you like you're crazy, because that's a, just a crazy thing to do, okay? But, um, but that is a property that we've seen in the deep network architectures uh, that people are using day in and day out. So a standard thing to do, even if you change tasks a little bit from object detection to instant segmentation, you can take your original, let's say, ImageNet data set, 
You've got a deep network with many layers, right? And the last layer of ImageNet is a mapping from some weird uh, you know, neural representation to the labels of ImageNet. You don't have the same labels in your COCO data set, okay? So we rip off the last layer and replace it with a fresh last layer, which has outputs for the labels that you want in the COCO data set, okay? And then, and then um, <clears throat> you, you just retrain, but you don't retrain from scratch. When you're training, I'll talk a little bit about training, but not too much about training. But when you're training, you take the weights that you already acquired from ImageNet and you just fine tune them for these layers and you've trained from scratch the last one by just running more gradient descent on Coco. This is the magic of transfer learning. Yeah? So you didn't have to have the same architecture between the two data sets. That's right, up to the, the last layers. Now what we're gonna see, for instance, is for the, inst the instance segmentation, you actually put a pretty sophisticated last layer that, that's different, but still using the front half of the network for, from, from ImageNet, for instance, is enough to do better on the, the full task. Now the intuition might be that you've somehow learned, you know, ImageNet was big enough, you learned something about natural images, about, you know, you learned some intermediate representations that captured the diversity of natural images. And this put you in the right lands, part of the, of the neural network parameter space, that somehow staying near there as you, and finding the best instance segmentation was better. You leveraged the diversity of the ImageNet data set to do better at COCO. That's too hand wavy for my taste, but that's the, that's the, the view of it. Okay, so this fine tuning is, is one of the biggest things that happened in deep learning. It didn't have to happen. It's also what provides us the ability to do you know, similar things with smaller data sets in manipulation. So now the prospect is um, I don't have to label 128 or 1.28 million images for manipulation. It turns out in many cases you can label tens of images, hundreds of images and do surprisingly well, sometimes zero. <laughs> Right, but uh, you have to some, you know at least that output layer needs to be trained with your new data set. Okay, so how do we make the instance level training data for um, for manipulation? There's a few sort of standard tools that I'd say almost every manipulation pipeline is using something kind of like this. You know that that if you want to come up with a lot of labels pixel-wise labels of objects that you're gonna manipulate. Uh, this is one called label fusion. Let me tell you the steps. I mentioned it once before when we were talking about ICP, but now you have, you, you have more context here, okay? So you've got a drill in the, uh, in the lab there. You wanna somehow use this to create a training data set with pixel-wise labels of the drill, okay? The steps are, are, are pretty simple. We're gonna first just take a lot, so you just move the camera around the drill in lots of different um, ways. Then we're gonna do a dense reconstruction, which people do, uh, you know, a few years ago, it was always with point clouds and uh, uh, these fusion algorithms, which are a lot like ICP. But, but basically you're gonna make all of these views with RGB data into one big point cloud. The same way we fused our multiple views on the, of the cameras, just imagine doing that with a moving camera. Right? Join all the point clouds together. It happens that that step is pretty effective at also estimating the pose of the camera. We, we, we assumed we knew where the pose of the camera was, but this will just estimate the pose of the camera. Okay. Now we said that ICP isn't strong enough to label the drill if you just give me a huge point cloud. We, tr we wanted it to be, it's not, okay? Um, but it turns out with a good guess, then ICP is fantastic, right? So, so the pipeline is basically make a, human, a, a user interface so that after taking a whole video of images, a human clicks like three times to, to you know, they say here's three points on the drill CAD model, here's three points in the, in the generated point cloud. That's an initial guess. Humans aren't very accurate at that. But then zhoom, it just snaps into place with ICP. Now you know a ground truth, you know, up to our ICP resolution location, pose of the drill. But we want instance labels out, 
okay? So given the CAD model and given the, the videos, you can just render back the drill into all of the images you took. And now suddenly you have a bunch of, now this isn't, uh, you know, these are very correlated images, so it's not as good as having 100,000 different, completely different images. But although they're very correlated, you have perfect labels, almost perfect labels of the pixel-wise mask of that, uh, of that drill, okay? And there's various ways to make that pipeline, but um, something like that has, has been used over and over and over again um, to generate training data for relevant manipulation items. What's amazing is that you know, relatively small amounts of training data with a pre-trained instant segmentation network works incredibly well in practice. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, so that's one way that we get um, gro uh, ground truth labels for our manipulation. The other big way is synthetic data, okay? <clears throat> over and over and over again now, people have been turning their pipelines to be more towards using simulation-based um, uh, data generation to train deep learning systems that are gonna work in the real world. So I motivated our clutter clearing example by this case, but if you, if you look at the um, RGBD sensor that we've been using the whole time, Right? We've been using the color image out, the depth image out, in order to make our point, our point cloud. But there's another image that comes out, which is the label image, which the real camera, of course, doesn't have, but this is designed entirely for generating training data. And this is just a random example of me dropping the, the <clears throat> objects in the bin and then making perfect pixel-wise masks from the, from the label image. It's super interesting that, um, I mean, this doesn't look very realistic, right? Uh, <clears throat> we can do a better job. We have better renderers that are slower, uh, and 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 we would I would absolutely recommend you use that if you want your your system trained in simulation to work in reality. But always, even the best rendering is going to have some. We call it a domain gap, right? That the uh, you know most of the time a human eye can tell you which one was simulated, which one was real. There's a really interesting trade-off that's ha that's, that happens, though. So, you, so you, could, you can give me you know, some amount of hand-labeled data, maybe using the label fusion kind of pipeline, where a human has annotated it. It's close, but it's, imp it's slightly imperfect, but they're realistic images. Or you can give me arbitrary gobs of basically free data that are perfectly labeled down to the pixel level with a domain gap. It turns out that I think the standard recipe now is to use a lot of simulated data and a very little bit of real data, but a lot of times the simulated data is actually enough to outperform the real data. Having a domain gap but absolutely perfect labels can actually be better than having the real images that are imperfectly labeled. It's actually, it's, there's a, there's a you know, well-known story that most of the big real data data sets, even MNIST, which is the number data set that everybody starts with in machine, in deep learning, they have errors in the labels, right? And so there's somehow a ceiling in what total performance the learning system probably can get, unless it has to learn the error, uh, you know, which is probably almost random, right? Uh, so human labels are imperfect, synthetic generation can get around them. So I went through and I made just exactly from the clutter clearing, I just dropped 100,000, like 10,000 images. Uh, I just dropped the, just randomized the initial conditions, picked from the random bin, dropped it, waited until they settled, took a picture, rendered both this and the object uh, labels, the, the, the masks, the object instances, a handful of sort of metadata, and I just made a big data set. And it'll, you'll use it on your, your piece set and we'll use it in the examples today. Okay, I did 10,000 images, which was probably way more than I needed, but I was just, I was going for it, you know, rather have too many than too few. And we're gonna use this to train our Cheez-It box and mustard bottle detector. Okay, questions about that so far? Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, the question being, uh, if the rendering was realistic on synthetic, 
that down and say you were able to render completely realistic? Would there be yeah. any trade off, or would it just be make sense to go with synthetic data completely? Good, good question. So, so if I could render so that there was really like no domain gap, I think I would probably always pick that. But the domain gap um, is more subtle than than you might think. So. Um, I, I, I emphasize the rendering quality, you know, so oftentimes like the shadows would look just a little artificial or the lighting, you know, is a little too spotlight and the, the real image is more, you know, whatever. There's, um, it's almost always the material properties, not the geometry that's, that makes the rendering hard. But that's not the part that, um, I think the bigger part of the domain gap that, it's, that you might not think about is just that is like the random way that I made these um, images, right? I dropped objects from the sky and they ran it in some initial condition. But if you look at like real sinks, probably people kind of put the plates down first and then the mugs. And there's some statistics of the environments that I probably didn't capture perfectly in the, um, in the sink. And there's probably, I used 10 objects, right? The ones I had 10 CAD files for. And the real world is open world. Anybody could put anything in the sink. So I think that's the domain gap that's a bigger one. It's, it's more about the art assets and the distributions over initial conditions than the render quality at these, these days. Yeah, sure. What about, what about the noise? Is it going to go okay? That's an awesome question. So yeah, what about the noise? People have been increasingly making higher fidelity noise models. A standard thing to do that tends to work really well is you, you actually, if you're doing physics-based rendering, uh, PBR, right, you can actually just render from two images and uh, uh, you, can, you can compute the depth and add noise to the, yeah, you, you can sort of do, you can capture even the, you know, the fact that transparent objects are, are missed. You can capture the fact that, uh, you know, sides of objects are often low quality. People are making those renders and the better simulators the uh, rendering-based simulators do it. I do think it makes a difference. Um, another thing people have done is they've trained networks to noise the image. So you take a perfect image coming out of, of a simulator and you just basically make it more artificial. Maybe there's, uh, yeah, you just learn the noise model. Uh, those can work too. Yeah, I think it does make a difference. Good, okay. <clears throat> So in most of the deep learning for perception world, things move so fast that if I told you about a particular algorithm today, it'd be obsolete by tomorrow, right? Um, but actually in instance segmentation, it's not true. There's an algorithm that came out in 2016, 2017, not exactly when it came out, um, and we're still using it today. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely gonna win some sort of test of time award. Okay, uh, it, it has had more staying power than anything else sort of in the, in the deep learning world. And that algorithm for, for instance segmentation is mask RCNN. So I, and people use it in robotics all the time. So let's make sure you get the user's level perspective of what's happening in mask RCNN. How many people know mask RCNN? How many people don't know mask RCNN, all right? Yeah, that's good. So that's my dilemma for the day, but that's, that's good. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> um, if you're thinking about making a neural architecture, let me say, I'm just trying to say a few of the high level sort of interesting things about it, right? But um, so we think about neural networks typically as you have some image coming in here. Object detection, for instance, would just be a label coming out. Maybe it would be um, you know, or maybe there's, it's a vector that's like uh, a cat, a dog, could be an entire vector, uh, elephant, all the cocoa tasks, right? Just one vector coming out. That's not what we're doing here. We're doing something more clever here, which is you have an image coming in and some variable number of outputs, right? It's gonna tell me one output per potential object recognition. And for each of those object recognitions, it's gonna tell me what it thinks the pixels are, right? So the first question you have to ask yourself is how did I go from something that goes from like an image to a scalar to an image to this rich output? And it's, it's, it's pretty simple, but it just takes a few steps. The first step was just uh, fully connected networks.
fully convolutional networks, sorry, fully convolutional networks. Which <clears throat> proposed and the architecture that seems to have staying power using convolutional kernels to go from an entire image in through my neural network to an entire dense image out. Okay? Pixel wise images out. The second component is going, which is pretty common in, in a lot of the object uh, uh, and visual recognition things, is to do these region based. Um, region-based vision systems, okay? Which is what I started to show on this next slide here. So the simplest way to think about that is imagine if I, if I wanna be able to have an arbitrary number of detections come out, one way you could achieve that is by just running your algorithm on a fixed size window, a fixed size image, but run it for lots of possible windows all over my image. Every time I run, you know, maybe I'm looking for a car, maybe that one just as I went by, I get a car detection that's above some threshold. So I'm gonna create a new output for the, for the, the sliding window that landed on top of the car, right? That's the basics of a region-based sort of um, convolutional architecture. And RCNN was, was the, the one that mask RCNN obviously builds on, okay? Mask RCNN does something much, much more clever than that. Instead of trying every possible, because you don't even know what size your detection is going to be, right? So you might have to try small boxes, large boxes, whatever. Um, there were algorithms for proposing regions that would just look at the image, maybe look at the statistics of the image, look, at, look for edges, look, at, look for blobs, and propose boxes that are likely to have a detection without knowing anything about the object, but they would just guess, hey, try this box, try this box, try this box. Okay, and that's what these, the RCNN kind of architectures would do. It would take a first step, they would pr propose a bunch of boxes, it would then do the object recognition, object detection kind of thing inside it, and then you'd get a variable number of outputs. Getting more fancy than that, um, it used to be that there were, in the first versions of this sort of pipeline, these were, um, you know, classical computer vision type, even when the uh, recognition side was using deep learning, the region proposals initially were using classical algorithms that were, like I said, we're looking for blobs or, or edges. Faster RCNN, if we go from fast RCNN to faster RCNN, they switched, they went ahead and pulled out the, the part that, he, that was, uh, you know, classical computer vision and put a, a no, another neural network in there to propose the regions, okay? So first neural network looks at the image and just says here are some possible regions to, to consider. And then the next part of it takes for each of those images, it tries to run the basic algorithm. Because those images are, that bounding box proposal is very general and potentially very weak, the other important step that happened was <clears throat> um, inside the image of interest, the network might not, not only say that this is a sheep, but you should refine your bounding box by this amount, okay? So if I had some bounding box proposal like this, it might say, yes, there's a sheep, and your bounding box really should have been this inset box. That made a big difference in sort of getting more accurate boxes. Your region proposal network didn't have to do all the work, it just had to get you close enough that a modification could get you tight. Okay? And <clears throat> mask RCNN did that, plus adding the, the sort of natural, now you have pixel-wise labels for all of the possible de detections that would be fit in each of the regions and labeled appropriately, and the whole thing goes through the deep learning pipeline to get trained end to end, and you get amazing networks out. 
like really amazing. So, so I, I told my, 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 I had a daughter that was doing FIRST Robotics, the Lego League of FIRST Robotics, right? And I was like, just try, just go, go on Colab, this is, you know, Google Colab, just try, take the PyTorch tutorial, <laughs> take a bunch of photos of the Legos with your phone, and yet I showed her how to annotate it, like 100 of them or something, that was as much. And she trained to mask our CNN, and by God, if it didn't recognize the Legos really well, right, right off the PyTorch tutorial. It's like incredibly good, incredibly robust. So many people have, um, have success right out of the box with mask our CNN. Default parameters, I didn't, we didn't do any tuning of like learning rates, we didn't do any tuning of, of like, you know, region proposal parameters, anything like that, it just worked. It's incredible. And, you know, six years later, people are basically still using it. I mean, they've been, made some refinements. There's version two, but it's incredibly good. I don't want to talk too much about the architecture, but maybe at, at a high level, that, does that kind of tell the Mascar CNN story a, a bit? Yeah? Okay, so <clears throat> I similarly don't want to tell the entire deep learning uh, optimization story, but I just feel I want to say a few words to connect the type of optimization landscapes we've talked about, since this is an optimization problem that's being solved, with um, what's happening here. Okay, so when we talked about nonlinear optimization before, right? We said we're going to minimize f of x, for instance, and maybe f of x was this complicated landscape. One of the ways that you could do that is with uh, just a gradient descent kind of algorithm, right? So you have some initial guess, and you go downhill, and you land at, at a minima. It's not guaranteed to be the global optima, but uh, but you know, it would get you, get you somewhere. For inverse kinematics, this can be a real problem, right? We can get stuck in, in bad local optima. There might be a good solution for inverse kinematics, and we don't find it with gradient descent. Deep learning is very much using gradient descent, right? It's using a stochastic version of gradient descent. The standard way that it's stochastic is just by taking, if you have a, a huge pie, if I have my um, 10,000 bucket images, I'm going to take a small subset of them, 32 of them or something at a time, pass them through the network, and I'll pick a random 32 each time. So that gives me a, a random evaluation of my gradient, and I'll do stochastic gradient descent to get down. That's when you hear people talk about SGD, that's stochastic gradient descent. But for the purposes of our discussion here, it's almost the same. <clears throat> what can happen, you know, the stochastic version in a general optimization problem, you would think that it has a lot of the same properties. It might walk downhill a little slower, right? You might kind of take a meandering path down to the, to the optima. It might also, um, the stochastic version of it might bounce out of a local minima by luck, you know. But it's rough, roughly this, uh, you know, this same sort of picture. So just like fine tuning and transfer learning was just amazing thing that happened in deep learning, something else amazing happened, which meant that I was, that my ability to train this with high confidence and good solutions, despite it solving this nonlinear optimization, it's somehow working. And that's been one of the mysteries that we've been, the people are doing a lot of work in deep learning theory to understand why. Do people know the basic story of that? Has people heard the basic story of that? There's a couple uh, big ideas. One of them is over-parameterization. The idea is that the pictures I draw here are wrong. They're not the pictures for deep learning because we have so many parameters, even compared to our data, that the landscape is so high dimensional that 
even though I have many nooks and crannies, they're with high probability probably connected in some weird way in the super high dimensional space. In particular, I can talk as much or as little as you guys want about this, but the, um, and there's people that know much more about it for sure, but the basic story is, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> if you have, let's say, this is the, the simplest version of it is this. If my second to last layer in my network, imagine I have the last layer here and it's really big. Let's say it's, you know, a million possible neurons in my second to last layer. And then I have a function I'm trying to learn from X to Y. Even if this first part of the network is just completely random, if I have random vectors here in some high dimensional space, then I can actually, with just my last layer, fit most functions almost perfectly. And this last layer is actually like a, typically a least squares problem. And I can expect that to work. And I can expect my training error to go to zero for big complicated networks, just because I had a ridiculously large, even random network to start with. That's, that idea is called the neural tangent kernel, if you want. or ultra-wide networks. <clears throat> okay, and then the second thing that seems to happen is something that people refer to as implicit regularization of stochastic gradient descent, which is that um, when I'm, Let's say after I've gotten my training error to zero, I've got sort of random vectors here. Gradient descent seems to do something good in the null space of the optimization that makes the weights here solve the problem not just in an arbitrary way, but it somehow chooses not random vectors in here in a way that generalizes incredibly well to new problems in the fine tuning sort of story. And that's been a big object of study in, in theoretical machine learning, is trying to understand why and how the things we're accidentally doing for gradient descent on these data sets leads to strong generalization. Okay? But there's two points I want you to have from, your, from the user perspective. <clears throat> it is not the case, some, some of you might disagree with me on this, it is not the case that you can put an arbitrary cost function on the end of these, of these networks and experience success, right? This, this pixel-wise protective law, uh, uh, this pixel-wise uh, cost that they use in mask RCNN, the particular architecture they used, leveraged these ideas in a deep way and, uh, uh, and was very successful. You could mess it up very easily. It can't learn everything arbitrarily. If it did, then you know, I would be using it for inverse kinematics and I would probably be mining Bitcoin or you know, something like this, right? There's things that we've figured out that it, would, it does extremely well and there's things that, we, that don't fit in that framework yet. A good example actually is if you were to do pose estimation, I mentioned this before, right? If you trained a network for pose estimation and you chose um, rotation, if you parameterize rotations badly, the network would have a very hard time learning. But, but other pose parameterizations work well, and that's because the landscape, even in the high dimensional space, is more suitable for learning. So unfortunately, the story's a little bit complicated, but it is all connected. There, it's all, there's all one truth here, which is that I'm trying to do nonlinear optimization, and these neural networks are setting up a rich landscape that works shockingly well when my kid wants to identify Legos. Right? That's like from here to there. Yeah, okay. Questions at that level of detail? Yes? So uh, those two things that you listed out, they, they are good things that we don't understand? Or they are We're increasingly understanding. Okay. Yes, that these are good things. Um, and people would argue about what are the most important features, but I think both of these have got a lot of, uh, a lot of consensus behind them. Yeah. The over-parameterization story, they're, they're two different pieces of the puzzle. The first thing is that for most deep learning problems, 
we put ourselves in a regime where we get training error equals zero. You basically, for your, for your training set, you expect to basically perfectly recover your, your desired, your, your training set, yeah? And the reason that that is possible is this overparameterization story. That's the training error equals zero part of the story. Why does it generalize to new things out of your training set? That's the implicit regularization story. This is the generalization part of the story. Both are amazing and, uh, and deserve more study. Yes? Great question, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you probably heard of overfitting. So the, the concern, the classic picture of overfitting would be if I'm trying to regress some points, maybe the right function is something like this and the points had a little bit of noise, right? But really, I wanted a, some simple function to come out and uh, accept that the data was generated with a little bit of noise. My overfit solution, if I'm really trying to get the training error to be almost zero on this, might have, in order to fit the function, might have done something like this, which is not the solution I was looking for, but it set the training error to zero. <clears throat> this is the story of implicit regularization is that it tends to somehow find the solutions that are more like this, that seem to generalize better and not this. Okay, there's very good theory and, and details, I mean the, the noise story of how does it fit, how does it do both of those at the same time? It sounds like that's inconsistent, but it's actually not inconsistent. There's people understand that the function it is learning even in noise, you know, at least my mental image, I think that this is a continually moving story, is that it actually learns something like this, but if you zoom in, it's actually learning like little delta functions that explain the noise, and it does actually get the training error to zero, but it lose, learns these smooth, beautiful generalizing functions. Okay? Theory of deep learning is an awesome topic. This is a poor representation of it, but maybe just enough for you to... Um, put it in context. I'm happy to take more of those, you know, those are, those are useful questions. Okay, so can we play with it for a second? So this is, I made, you know, I made a, uh, I actually made three notebooks, okay? All of them are, are there. Now this, it's actually, um, Deep Note is completely awesome in every way, almost every way. They, um, they're, they give free compute, you know, it's incredible, it's got a good interface, it's most of the time works. Uh, their GPU support is not free. That's the one, you know, it's a buy-in. Uh, if you needed it for your project, honestly, there's a chance I could ask and get you, you know, like a, a special thing for the, because they really are, they like the class. <laughs> um, it happens that one of them that's high up in the company did robotics, so it's like, yes, <laughs> we got an in. Um, okay, so, so, um, so that's great, uh, but, these are the three notebooks that we're gonna, we actually point you to Co Google's Colaboratory instead of DeepNote. And the reason for that is that Colab is just another online server, it's from Google, it happens to have a different pay structure and gives you GPUs. For training a deep network, you want a GPU, okay? So I'm gonna run it locally here, but it runs fine on, uh, uh, on Colab. Okay, so <clears throat> there's three notebooks. One of them was the data generation notebook, which I just, you probably don't want to run that ever. You could look at it and say like, okay, when you want to use it for your own pipeline, that's great. It's the thing that runs the clutter clearing for like a while, generates a, a huge file on my disk uh, with all the labels and everything like that. Then there's the training, which runs for a long time that uh, uh, will, will train the neural network given pre-trained weights from Coco V1, which was pre-trained from ImageNet. Okay, and that works better than if I were to just train from scratch. The last one is the inference network, that's what I'm gonna run now, which is just, I'm gonna put a new image in, I'm gonna just drop my bins again, new image in, and render the output. Okay, and we'll see how it works.
it's interesting. So this is just uh, in, it's using PyTorch. I did, if I didn't say it, we were using PyTorch for these parts of the class. Uh, although Brian was, was quick, he said, make sure you tell them that if you're really running, you know, training PyTorch is great, but when you're running it on the robot, you should use TensorRT or something else that's, that would compile it into a much faster, uh, you know, PyTorch is not the fast inference engine. It's the great training, flexible thing, but you should compile it down into some more optimized code for runtime. Okay. Um, the output of Mascar CNN. If you just say, give me an input, what's the output? It has, um, oh, that's the, that's the model, sorry. If you look at the output, it comes, you gives you this big dictionary, right? It gives you a dictionary that has like, it could do multiple images at a time. This is for each image, it tells you a, a list of boxes that were possible detections, a list of labels for those boxes, which are the numbers I assigned in my training data. It gives you scores on how confident it is. It looks like in this one, it was actually very confident, very confident, very confident, and then not very confident at all. So we'll probably see something ridiculous on the last, uh, the last detection, because it's 0.05 confidence compared to 9, 0.99 for all the others, okay? And then it gives me the images, which are the masks. That's a crazy thing to come up. You should, let's just appreciate for a second that that's absolutely nuts that a network would produce all that stuff. I mean, I remember, uh, I'm old now, so, um, like, we had projects with Jan LeCun, for instance, a while ago, right? And Jan LeCun used to come to our meetings, and he would bring a camera around and, like, train a neural network on the, a little convolutional neural network on the fly. And his demos were just always awesome. But I, I completely admit that I, 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 every night I would go home and be like, okay, but there's just, that just doesn't scale. Like, what are you going to have, like, a million outputs for all the different possible labels on your network? Like, that's, no one's ever going to do that. And I was just wrong. <laughs> People do do that, right? You have like cats and dogs and elephants and everything. You know, he always had three labels that he was training on the fly, and I thought that was great. But these things are enormous, massive, millions of parameters, millions of outputs, um, and it's all on the GPU and super fast. I'm running on the CPU now, by the way. So this is my image in, <clears throat> and this is my masks out. Okay, so take a look at your image. Mask number one, amazing, right? It found a mustard bottle. Mask number two, probably my jello, right? The other jello. Okay, and the last one is ridiculous, right? Because it was, it, it told me it was gonna be ridiculous, right? That one looks weird. Oh, that's like the occlude, oh wow, right? That's the occluded mustard bottle. And it just gave, the, it gave a pretty darn good, look at that, you can actually see the box cut out of it. That's actually incredibly good, right? And I, I didn't train, change anything. This is just the default parameters of everything, okay? Now let's change, check the object detections. Okay, that's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> Completely missed the Cheez-It box on the side. Uh, that is pretty funny. Um, but, all right, the rest of them, incredibly good, right? Incredibly good. I wonder, that might be, I should have changed my region proposal network parameters, right? Maybe it didn't have one big enough to, <laughs> to get the big flat cheese it box. It's probably dialed in for things that are about the size of a dog in a picture. Okay, right? Amazing. So each one of those gives a bounding box, which is the, the pixels, that's what the, the corners of the pixels, and a label, which I can associate back with my text label. Um, we can run it a few more times here. This is, finds spam cans, finds domino cans, potted meat, sugar box. It's incredible, right? Absolutely incredible. Amazing, right? Okay, so that, like, obviously we should use this <laughs> in robotics. It's just so good. Any questions on that? Anybody, you know, we could poke it if you have like something else. I, I wanted to see what you try. I mean, I can't retrain it on my laptop now, but I could uh, do, do any inference queries you're curious about. Or you can tonight. There was um, one that allowed the, allowed to visualize the region proposal. Could you take a look at that quickly? Yeah, sure. Maybe see what happens if you use it at all. So <clears throat> there are, uh, okay, I could probably get, 
let me do it so that it has the right image. The caveat here is there's like order a thousand or more uh, images proposed and I didn't visualize all of them. So the test that you, I think your test is extremely good, but oh, okay, well, so what we did learn here that is that the boxes are at least big enough. So my concern about them not being big enough is wrong. <laughs> uh, but I can't say that it didn't have a box around the cheese it. it. I would guess it probably did. There's like a thousand, order a thousand uh, region proposals. It could, I mean, it could be that I never had a flat Cheez-It box in my data set. Could be not a perfect network, you know. It's, um, that is the one, as, as powerful and amazing as it is, when it doesn't work, the only recourse we have is to add more data, really. I mean, you could change parameters and retrain and do some hyper-parameter sweeps, but, um, you know, a lot of the stuff we're talking about in this class if, it's, if it doesn't work, I could, you know, we can tell you why. We can tell you how to debug it right now. Um, this one, I, I can't. Yes? But wouldn't it predict like, some community scenario within the image map or prototype uh, if you have like, cross-legged uh, boxes like that? Uh, so, so the question is, why wouldn't it produce cornflakes or something from the Cocoa data set? That's a good question. So it will never do that because I've ripped off the Cocoa head and the last layer is, is specific to my data set. So it'll only ever say the things in my data set. Um, it might be biased towards things that were in the Coco data set because of its pre-trained layers. But um, you know, it, has, it has confidence thresholds that it'll only report that the object was there if it was above some confidence threshold. So it might be that there's a great box right around the Cheez-It and it's just slightly below some confidence threshold. Good, okay. I wanna land a few more sort of high level ideas. Well, let's, let's, we can take our stretch today, yeah? Let's take our quick stretch. That's a good time. Okay, so if you've learned one thing so far, uh, or you know, if, I think the mask RCNN is gonna be a tool that you will use if you understand its inputs and outputs, you're already gonna have an incredibly powerful tool at your disposal, and maybe you, you picked up a few of the buzzwords from, from deep learning theory and the like that, that uh, I would encourage you to study further. <clears throat> But I still think we haven't, I haven't told you the complete story yet about how to get big data for robotics, right? We told you two examples, the label fusion kind of idea where we annotated our, our lab captured and then the synthetic data. Both of those are somewhat limited because for instance, I only have a handful of different object models that I put in my simulator. I can generate as many of them as I want, but I don't have the diversity of the real world. Right? And the same thing, what I can get in lab is not gonna represent the diversity. If I wanna think about open world manipulation, I want a robot that I go to program, it leaves, and it's gonna manipulate anything in your house. I haven't given you an answer for that yet, and I don't have a complete answer yet, but, but the wor this is what people are working on hard now. How do you have this kind of a tool chain that could manipulate incredibly large classes of objects? Um, <clears throat> There was one more point I was gonna make, but I think you know roughly that um, you could go from the mask RCNN to the uh, model-based grasp selection or the antipolar grasp selection. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll come back to those in, at the end to close things. But <clears throat> um, the big new trend is self-supervised learning, right? I think m many of you will have 
heard that also. In, in particular, we have this amazing property that if I've trained on ImageNet, on object detection, for instance, then I could use those weights to help me do better on instance, you know, on pixel level segmentation. I trained on one task on a relevant data set, and I did better on a different task. So if you open up your mind then and say, well, why did I pick object detection, which required human labels for my first task? Why don't I pick something that doesn't require human labels, that I could auto-label for my first task? I just need to pick some surrogate task that the network, in order to achieve, learns something relevant in those first layers to copy over. So the new thing is find, find clever new tasks that don't require human supervision, unleash them on the entire internet, and use those backbones as pre-training for your, um, for your runtime, okay? So one of the most famous examples is SimClear, where um, the idea is very simple, right? It's basically, I'm gonna take my original image of my dog, and I'm gonna just start perturbing the image in lots of different ways, okay? I'll crop and resize, whatever. I, Google basically threw the, this was a shotgun approach to research, right? which is powerful and good, right? But it, they're like, let's try every possible perturbation, and then we'll take the you know, 10 that worked the best, roughly, and we'll call that our algorithm, right? But they just absolutely tried all kinds of crazy stuff. And then most of these, uh, you know, one of the dominant ways to do self-supervised learning is to set up something where it's, you take the, the training data and you just compare and contrast things that you know to be true or, or, or false. So this is a contrastive learning paradigm. The animation's a little annoying, but hopefully it gets the point across, okay? So instead of having labels for the dog and labels for the chair, it turns out to be enough to say the dog is not the chair, okay? If you can say that this and this are the same image because they're just perturbations of the same image, which you know to be true, you've constructed that by construction to be true, you say those are the same image and those are not the same as the perturbations of the chair, then you don't need any human to annotate that. And what's amazing, okay, the general trend is that um, they, oftentimes these don't do quite as well in peak performance, but for free, you know, you get so much, you can feed them with so much data that they, they do incredibly well. Uh, I mean, at some point you can actually outperform some of the original uh, human labels. One more second, one second. Another example that's a little closer to robotics, which is, tends to be, I think, learning representations that are more about 3D understanding of the world uh, <clears throat> is monocular depth estimation. This is actually, this is the one that works the best right now, or one of the best right now, but the original idea is even simpler. So imagine I have two cameras, and I could say, from two cameras, I can figure out the depth using stere a stereo algorithm. And I wanna train to be able to guess stereo from one camera. Okay, well, I'll just carry my two cameras around and use the two cameras to project the computed stereo to give me the ground truth answer, but just train the function from one camera. And you train monocular depth from an image to predict the depth, okay? The, the newer architectures are a little bit more complicated. They're, they're doing reconstruction. They take your current frame, you take your second frame, either from in time or, or uh, alongside. You try to predict the relative, I mean, it's more complicated architectures now, but these work incredibly well to the point where people can take just an RGB camera and move it around as if it's a depth camera, except by the way, it still does well on blank walls, and by the way, it still does pretty well on uh, you know, visible, you know, transparent objects and things like that. It's incredibly good, it's incredibly good. Sorry, did you have a question? Explain this. Yeah. The cost function, instead of saying it is a dog or it is a chair, is to say, I want to. I'm going to predict an outcome that says that the dog and the chair are. The dog is not a chair, and the and the the pieces of dog that have been translated are the same. So these are contrastive learnings. You take typically two uh, images, you push them through, 
The ones that are the same, you try to make close together in some representation space. And the ones that are, you know to be different, you push them apart. I, I wouldn't ever say you couldn't do that uh, with a deep learning perception system. I, what I would say is you need more data, maybe. Or a bigger network, right? Or more hours of SGD. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of, of levels of, of accuracy. Yes? Okay, that's a really good point. Good point. So, yeah, sorry, the point to, to say it into the microphone here is that I could have accidentally picked two pictures of the same dog in my data set. And then the contrastive learning is actually sort of wrong, right? Because I could have had, I could have said this dog is not the dog. The objective is basically that that happens rarely enough in a big data set that it's okay. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah, there's no, there's, I, there's no labeled dog, no labeled chair anywhere here. It's just raw images. Good point. Okay, so this is actually, um, so uh, Leroy's been uh, playing with this kind of uh, the self-supervised paradigms and asking about some of the harder questions about what it means for representations for manipulation. And um, it's actually super interesting if you, if you think about, I mean, everybody's on this quest for finding you know, the big data moment in manipulation. Right, and so we've been working with Amazon, who has big data, and they are doing manipulation, right? And Leroy started asking the question, uh, you know, do they have enough data? How should we process that data in order to learn representations that would be incredibly powerful, okay? And <clears throat> the interesting thing that happens in the, a lot of these real world applications is something called distribution shift. So if you think about, I mean, I took the same image three times. That was sort of antithetical to my point. But uh, uh, you can imagine if you have similar robots deployed in different warehouses, right, then they have very similar data coming in. But there's a, a big question of should you train only, I mean, but they're, they're a little bit different. Like the, I'll show you a couple different specific ways that they're different, okay? Um, so should the robot in New Jersey train on the perception data from Boston? Yes or no, right? It seems like it's more data, but the boxes in Boston might be statistically a little bit different than the boxes in New Jersey. Or the boxes at peak season might be more dense, for instance, on the conveyor belt than the, the boxes off peak, right? If they have crazy shifts in, in distribution. So there's this question of um, more data is not actually, is, we know that more data is not always better that if you have diff data that is different distri from a different distribution, it can sometimes hurt you. Sometimes it doesn't, but, but it, we know that it can. So there's a big question, how much should you share data? How much should you snarf up? How much should you specialize? And <clears throat> even more interesting, I won't talk much at all about this, is that, that you're doing this training in a decentralized way. So you have many different neural networks potentially living in different places and different copies of the neural network, how do they uh, how do you do the gradient descent update on that? <clears throat> okay, but the the distribution shift is very real in their data sets, right? They have different lighting conditions, different the densities, the um, they have different robots and upstream hand, handling systems. <laughs> Things like the sensors are, respond differently at different altitudes and stuff like this. They have different uh, suction grippers in different places. So <clears throat> um, you know. If you look at a, a few different locations, you might see very different types of packages or density of packages. This place does mostly, you know, the, those envelopes that you can almost recycle. Um, and then, you know, this one has more of these, right, for instance. And sometimes you have uh, very dense, sometimes you have very sparse. So it's just this interesting question of like, self-supervised learning seems to work, but how exactly do you deploy it at the scale? And is it, you know, is it going to get us big data in manipulation? And this is the takeaway, is that um, if you just train with all, with, um, directly on doing image segmentation with supervised learning, for instance, on your local data, 
you can actually overfit. I just I said overfitting isn't as big of an issue anymore, but you can overfit still to your data and, and have worse performance if you start uh, applying that across a distribution shift. You have limited robustness to distribution shift. If, the, um, if peak season comes, your, your distribution moves, you can have overfit to your data. And there's a really big thing that seems to be happening, and you guys know this. You've seen like the GPT-3 and Dolly and stable diffusion and all this craziness, right? But there's something about these self-supervised objectives that seem to be learning something more general about the internet or about the data in the warehouses. And they tend to be more robust to distribution shift. And this is like the big, big question in supervised learning, self-supervised learning for manipulation is what's the right way to learn these representations using as much data as possible that work for lots of downstream tasks. And the self-supervised objectives seem to be learning representations that transfer more generally than the supervised ones. It's almost like saying that this dog is not a chair forces me to learn something general about images. And saying it's a dog, I could have special case the dog. OK, and the last thing I'll mention here is all the GPT-3, uh, everything, it, it's coming into manipulation in a big way, uh, <clears throat> which is even if we can't get enough labeled data or self-supervised data locally, people are asking the big questions of how do I take everybody else's foundation models, right? So the, the models that have been trained on huge language corpuses, huge vision corpuses, huge text-to-vision to corpuses, and somehow use that information to augment my small data in robotics. And <clears throat> CLIP is the one that I think most roboticists have picked up of the, of the big models. CLIP was, is a vision to text model. And it's like every roboticist is like, oh, I could have I taken my image and put it into this encoding. And I, oh, I could have a sentence. I could put that into the encoding. And so every, people are finding lots of different ways to use that. And the takeaway is that compared to the mask RCNN pipeline, which I talked about, which does reasonable things on the labels you've trained, these foundation models are getting us to the point where out of the box, you now have potential labels from the entire internet, like kind of the captions that everybody has put on the internet. You could just walk around the lab and point it at stuff and there's a chance it will label some, it will give you a sensible label out of the box in the open world, right? Not, it's not perfect, it's not perfect, but it's mind blowing. <laughs> it's mind blowing. So how do we use, even for the instance segmentation problem, how do you leverage super large data trained with self-supervised learning, even on a surrogate task, to make us pick up any object <laughs> and manipulate any object? Okay. Good. So the, the instance segmentation is a very much a geometry computer vision task. It is not enough for manipulation. If I want to know how much the objects weigh, right? Flickr doesn't have a data set that where people, everybody, I mean, prob actually, it probably does. You could probably say, how much does that weigh? And it would say, you know, 2.7 kilograms. It would probably be, like, almost right. But I'm not going to count on that for my pipeline, right? Um, <clears throat> so. If, I, if you want to know, like, how, what's the friction? Where's a good place to pick this up, right? That I don't think we have the answer directly from this. That's why I tried, I wanted to say, in this lecture, I wanted to give you, like, a super fast overview of what computer vision relative to, you know, the standard computer vision pipelines for manipulation can look like. On Thursday, we're going to say that the computer vision pipelines don't answer all the questions that we need. We need more than computer vision to pick things up. There's other, ob there's other properties of the object that we care about rather than just what it's, every pixel label is. Okay, so we'll talk about that on, on Thursday. Any other big questions about that? There's going to be an entire lecture on it uh, a little bit later, yeah. So, but um, on the control side, learning is having a big impact too, for sure. And the biggest impact is, is connecting with vision. 
So we were, our, a lot of our classic pipelines didn't have a way, they're, they're incredibly good, uh, but they didn't have a way to talk to cameras because that handing a 640 by 480 RGB image into a, a PID controller doesn't make sense. So, um, uh, so we found we're getting new tools for connecting those wires. Yes, good. Of what? A vial. Like, uh, well, this is click all the box, but we have click all the box, but much better. Yeah, I didn't put it in. He told me I should put in his, this, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I read the paper. I read yeah. the paper, but so, I didn't. Although, like, this is just crappy, it says, like, uh, like the, for, for so many reasons, for, like, the calendar, like, in fact, like, uh, if you, there are more than models that do this much, much better, and it's like, you input the text, and like it can find the object really accurately with fine grained detections. For example, like some, let's say I put a sticker, a yellow sticker on my laptop. And now like I take a photo of a room with all the laptops and I query with a laptop with yellow stickers. And the latest state of our model can do it pretty well. It will only give you, like it assign the highest probability to the laptop with yellow sticker. And uh, I think it's going to be very, very impactful in robotics. Because previously we could only do like a, t fix, uh, a fixed list of like 20 categories or like 100 categories. Now it's just anything described uh, as soon as you can describe it with language. Awesome. Yes. Thank you for saying that. And so, yeah, I think that is a part of, a, in my mind, a zoo of ways that people have found to put these large language models and connect them to manipulation, right? Good. Any other? I mean, uh, any other big commentaries? That Good. Okay. I'll hang around outside. If it, I think we have a lecture coming in, so I'll hang around outside if anybody wants to talk about projects. But we'll see you Thursday. <laughs>